We want to welcome you to another customer success webinar series brought to you by Client Success, being broadcast from beautiful Utah. I'm Burke Alder, VP of Marketing and a customer success strategist here at Client Success. Client Success is a customer success management platform that helps leaders and CSMs retain and grow their customer base. We help SaaS companies and organizations around the world do this through communication and collaboration across the entire customer journey. Today, we are super excited to have with us Lucas Quanstrom. Uh, he is from a CEO and founder of Ontic. He is going to walk through this amazing innovation called the Churn Probability Score Framework. I have a few questions from a housekeeping perspective before we get started. A lot of you will have asked, will this webinar be recorded? And the answer is yes, it will be recorded and sent to your inbox. You can actually ask questions as the webinar is, as, as we participate. This webinar is meant to be collaborative. There is a Q&A feature at the bottom that you can just click on and you can type in answers and we will do our best to answer those during the webinar. Let me talk to you a little about how we got introduced to Lucas and uh, this methodology on the term probability score. Each year we host the summit, at, it's called the CS100 Summit. Uh, this last year we had Innovator of the Year was, a, was uh, something that we presented. We had three finalists and Lucas was one of those. And he presented on this topic called the churn probability score, a way that you can take your customers and your organization and really predict risks and success. We thought it was so phenomenal that we wanted to make sure that others around the world who are joining us today uh, could also understand this framework. If you have an innovation like Lucas's and you want to be on stage like Lucas and present your innovation, you can submit your innovation to cs100summit.clientsuccess.com to learn more information and to actually submit your idea. It's my pleasure to welcome Lucas Quanstrom, CEO and founder of Ontic Technologies. Ontic, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but we can, uh, you can, Help me if I'm not. You're good. Ontic is an early stage technology provider of protect protective intelligence solutions, leveraging deep analytics and intelligence. Ontic discovers signals, inv investigates risk, and initiates immediate and collaborative action. Ontic works to ensure corporations and institutions' most prized assets are safe, their people. So, Lucas, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Burke, and uh, thank you all the attendees for uh, jumping on today. Uh, really appreciate uh, the attention to this important topic. Um, and if you're a customer success leader, uh, I think this will hit near and dear to your heart. Um, and I look forward to the questions in the Q&A session as well. Nothing's out of bounds in terms of questions. So um, let's have some fun and explore and see how we can help solve this problem together. So uh, today I'm gonna talk about um, really um, what a, a huge calling that we're seeing, at least I saw more trend in uh, the customer success organization was the ability to see the future. And what I mean by that is to see the future in terms of what's happening from a performance standpoint with our customers. Um, and as we roll up our data to executive leadership, to board members, um, what, what can we see in terms of the likelihood that we're going to retain our ARR or their customer base and those prized uh, recurring revenue dollars, of course, um, that only get more valuable year over year. And the best way in order um, to actually see that future, in my view, was to actually create that future. And in order to create it, I needed to have some understanding of what the current realities were so I could mold that future and actually help predict those outcomes. So, um, working the next slide here. Yep. What we uh, were, were dealt with in the early stages of uh, our success organization was the ability to see everything that was going on within the team. Okay, a team of five, 10 people. If you have you know, hundreds of customers, you might be able to manage around this. A, as you get into hundreds of um, success management organization size, into thousands of customers, um, the ability to see all this data is impossible, and so we're left with guesswork. And guesswork is very, dangerous, uh, doesn't help you sleep at night as the one who's presenting data based on guesswork, 
um, but it also uh, can have pretty dire consequences about your ability to even lead an organization if you're living in a model of guesswork. So instead of guesswork, um, we need to do something more predictable. However, there's so much data to even manage through um, that we need to have some sort of um, initiative in place to make sense of these signals that customers are sending. And what kind of signals are we talking about here? We're talking about customer health signals, whether it's um, their adoption of our product. So they're using the right features that are key and core to our business and super sticky. Do we have a um, good communication cadence with the right executive leadership and the economic buyer at the customer base, as well as um, influencers who are champions of our product? Um, do we have uh, references coming from customers? Will they speak on webinars? Will they um, be an analyst reference? Do they actually answer MPS or CSAT questions, right? All of these are customer signals, and there's simply too many of these signals to manage manually um, and to have full visibility to without something in place to help do this. So on the next slide here, um, what's really required is something that can help avoid the dire consequences of not seeing these signals. And of course that, you know, five letter word that we all have here, which is churn, we definitely want to avoid. Um, most importantly though, we want to avoid surprise churn. This is especially uh, harmful to the business, not being able to see churn that's around the corner. Uh, last day of the quarter, last week of the quarter, having deals that didn't come through, having customer um, renewals that slipped or customers that don't renew that were unanticipated um, is certainly um, probably the worst thing I can think of from a churn perspective. Known churn or involuntary churn, there's some things that we can get around and be acceptable, but surprise is just completely unacceptable. So a framework was really required in order to manage all of these signals, in order to help kind of see and predict that future outcome uh, that we were trying to accomplish. And a framework that uh, was created, we called the churn probability score. And you're welcome to call it whatever you feel fits, you know, a churn predictability score, or it could be a renewal health score. Uh, but we called it a churn probability score. And um, ultimately, this was just a simple score that represented the likelihood that a customer was going to have a given amount of churn. And an aggregate that gave us across our customer portfolio a good understanding of the amount of churn that we could forecast for a given quarter. The churn probability score has many benefits. Um, top five here that I chose to highlight were the ability to know more about what's happening in your customer base, the ability to predict um, what's going to happen in terms of revenue, um, recurring revenue saved, ability to plan to save the right revenue, to communicate both internally and externally, and then to actually resolve as much of this as you can. So let's dive into each one of these, starting with what you get to know by having a CPS in place. First thing you get to understand is actually what customers are at risk. And yeah, like I said, when you have a smaller team, smaller customer base, you might know a lot of these things um, just through the high touch model that you have. But at scale, having an understanding of what customers are at risk, what part of the customer that they purchased is at risk if you sell multiple products, um, is really important to see and have visibility to do to this. And then in an area that's really easy to consume from multiple stakeholders within the business. Next is why, what's going on? Not just what, oh, go back, sorry, Bert, to keep on that no one. Go, um, not just what customers are at risk, but why are these customers at risk? So what's going on behind um, this risk? Are they unhappy with the product? Are they unhappy with the front office teams they're working with? Um, was it an overselling issue? There's many reasons why a customer could be at risk, but having visibility to that and seeing trends in that and aggregate data is also very useful. And then understanding the likelihood that there is going to be churn as a like percentage or a confidence level and your understanding of, well, there is some risk, but what's our confidence level that it will renew or not? The next benefit outside of no, on the next slide here, we can go to Burke, is predict. So the ability to understand where we will have churn or who, right, which customer will have churn. Um, this is really important because we might want to look at churn by region or by vertical, if you're selling by verticals, or by even um, success manager to understand that. But where are we going to have churn 
um, is very important to understand because that'll get into the like fourth item here and third one is how to plan and communicate. Um, but then also not just where, but how much churn can we expect? Will we have products that disappear from the customer's contract? Uh, will they decrease in terms of seat utilization? Um, how much churn can we actually expect so we can forecast accurate numbers uh, for quarterly reporting to the board or other stakeholders? Third benefit is plan then. So now that you have access and visibility to this data, what are you going to do with it? Where should we focus customer save efforts? What's the most savable dollars that we can see within the portfolio? Let's go after those for sure. Um, and then in addition to not only saving in that quarter, that revenue, where should we in the future prevent churn by focusing on product improvements or other business improvements in terms of how we go to market, how we support customers, it doesn't have to be just be product, um, but where should we focus improvements in the business so that we can make a greater impact in saving future revenue. And then understanding what is required to save customers ongoing if we see these systemic trends. So this not only helps within the current quarter view, but should be a long tail benefit for additional planning um, to prevent future churn events from occurring. Fourth one then is communication. And communication is super important, especially within the organization so that everyone can be, as I say, marching from the beat of the same drum or choose your favorite little line there, but to internal executive stakeholders. What can we communicate concisely, clearly, uh, so we're not sending too much information that's hard to consume, we're also not giving enough, and then they're surprised, right? That's a really bad scenario as well. So how can we communicate internally? Um, how can we then communicate to these at-risk customers? So now that we know who these customers are, we know why they're at risk, um, through that planning step before, you then can understand what you should communicate um, what efforts need to be put in place, and how you're going to make sure the customer is aware of what you're going to do to try to ensure their success ongoing. And then internally within the business, A, for visibility within the company um, in terms of performance and how we're doing with customers, but to a couple specific organizations as well. It's product marketing to help communicate better, maybe some areas in which we're not communicating the value of the product enough under utilization items to the product teams in terms of where customers are seeing frustration or pain in terms of the product, and then the front office team, whether it's sellers, whether it's the success organization, whether it's technical support, but what are customers frustrated with? What are those trends that we're seeing out of a churn probability score? The fifth benefit here um, is then resolve. And of course, this is what we all are hoping to have happen here, which is we wanna resolve as much churn as possible, right? We wanna renew as many dollars as possible. Those were hard earned dollars, at likely a higher cost of acquisition initially than that cost of um, renewing those dollars. Uh, so very important to the business model of SaaS business. Um, and then of course, we also wanna resolve any company issues that we see that are systemic and the root cause of any customer pain that we uncover. So all of these are um, benefits that you know, we receive by using a CPS like this. I'm sure there are more welcome feedback on other uh, benefits that you might see through an initiative like a churn probability score. So our churn probability score, we're going to dive into some details now on how it works, how it's composed. And um, this is just one model here. Um, there's many ways in which you could slice this, but churn probability score for us ranged from a 0 to 13 scale. You know, it's not very clean, of course, but 0 to 10 or 0 to 100, that's very easy. Uh, but this was based on historical data and the amount of tiers that we would see in terms of percent likelihood for churn. So you may have one to five. You can have a variety. Um, you'll want to use your own data set to really drive what this should be. And actually, at the end of this presentation, too, Burke will chime in and how um, client success can help you do this. Um, and we can talk about it, too, in some of the open discussion. Um, but in our model, a high score, a 13, meant a high probability of churn. Maybe you like going the golf model and switch it around and go low is, um, you know, bad. But in this case, or low would be good in golf. But in this case, for us, high score, high probability of churn. You could flip and say high score, high likelihood of renewal, whatever you like. And then clients not at risk are given a zero as a score. So if we don't see any risk in a customer at any point in time, then they get a zero and they're not reviewed because there's enough data from customers who are at risk. So what's in this CPS? What's in the box here? Um, so this is one example here, and we have a couple different variables that we looked at. Your variables might differ. You might have more, you might have less, 
Um, and typically the variables that you're looking at are driven by what type of data can you get access to today, right? So if you don't have access to um, reason codes or relationship health score or their time to renewal, you know, I'd recommend these things, but you might have access to more than this simple list here of just seven items. Um, but in this case, what was in this particular CPS was a red account priority. The reason this was included is this was a subjective number that the customer success organization had the ability to say, hey, this is a, you know, a pretty high issue here, or no, this is severe. Like a code one red was, yep, this is really at risk, or, oh, you know, code two, is they're kind of disgruntled, not really happy, but they haven't said, oh, no, we're not renewing, or they haven't gone silent you know, on us at this point. So this allowed for some interpretation instead of just very objective data points where the success organization could influence the score here based on their relationship with the customer. The next one was a reason type. And so your reason types may change. Um, here were some reason types. And we weighted all of these, by the way, on like the severity of the issue um, as we saw in terms of its impact to churn. So in this, we had budget change, we had an executive departure, we had a poor relationship, product issue, product adoption issue, platform stability, an overselling issue. And again, like I said, you might have more. But then the weight, when we saw budget change issue, typically that could mean things like going out of business, uh, bankruptcy, um, acquired. You know, those are some things we're like, okay, that's going to be pretty significant in terms of um, the impact to this organization. A key executive departure, also pretty significant too. So that had a higher weighting than some of the other things we saw around product issues. So reason type was a pretty powerful field. And that one, again, allows for some subjectivity because there could be multiple things happening with the customer. But in this model, you had to pick the most important one. You could get fancy and weight these if you wanted to create multiple reason types. The relationship health score was an objective measure based on data points within our CRM for managing our customer relationships. So a green, obviously healthy relationship with the customer. Um, this is built on adoption, um, using key features, our communication cadence. So it was another score that impacted that relationship health in terms of, you know, how, what was the quality of our relationship. And so that was then very objective um, because you either scored a green, yellow, or red based on your product utilization. Time to renewal was another one. Again, based on the CRM you're using, you should definitely have access to this information. When's the customer up for renewal? If it was within a pretty short window, you know, they're up in the next month or two, and there's an issue, that's a lot trickier to deal with than if you have six months to manage through or more of uh, the issues the customer is facing. So we weighted those appropriately. Growth potential on the account, you can weigh this in many different ways. In our model, we just looked at open opportunities in Salesforce, and if we saw open opportunities for net new revenue, then there was growth potential. Um, if we didn't see those, then there was not. So this was, it could be subjective. You could have this be a um, success management driven. Yeah, I think there's growth potential here because of my you know, gut feeling and relationship, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in our model, it was objective based on open opportunity records that we saw within the account. ARR, or if you deal with MRR, totally fine, um, but you certainly should have access to this. For us, in our particular product set, lower ARR customers were riskier. Um, so in this model, they had a, a higher CPS weight, whereas our largest accounts, less risky. And a lot of this, in fact, to like the switching costs and how much they've invested in leveraging our solution. Um, and so you might have a different model where some of your higher tier customers or maybe the mid tier, maybe the low ones are handled differently and you have, you know, an SMB product line for low customers, but it's those mid ones as they make a jump um, that become a little more problematic. Um, so understand your customer base. And I'll talk about that in a second, how you get to this understanding. And then the, the seventh uh, metric uh, we had here, the seventh variable is the client solution they're, per they're using. So we had multiple product lines, multiple use cases. And so um, based on which, what use case the customer had, um, they were a bit stickier or not based on that use case. So in this model here, if they were using us for a customer service use case, it was a pretty sticky solution. We were really good at that um, versus that they were using us maybe for analytics only or for just PR use case or advocacy, um, then it was a little bit um, less sticky. Still could see value there, but we saw a lot more risk in those solutions. All right, so let's um, dive a little bit deeper into the next part of this, uh, Burke, on the next slide, which is the variables and scoring. 
So this looks like a little funny because the zero through two is the uh, same turn probability range, um, but just with fleshing these out because we'd get ones or twos so you can see it. So as we saw a couple slides ago, our scale was a zero to 13. And then based on historical data, we looked at the probability of churn um, within those ranges. And that's how we came up with this scoring. So yours might be more simple. You might say, hey, if someone's a one, they have a you know, zero to 20% chance. If they're a two, they have a 20 to 40, whatever it might be. Um, but ours was based on historical data quarter over quarter that we were able to run the regression analysis on and pull this out. And so in this model, if someone scores a 10 in their CPS scoring from the previous slide, then they're at 80 to 85% of their revenue is at risk. Um, so it's pretty significant. Whereas if they're a uh, two, uh, zero to 19% of that revenue is at risk in this model. So let's unpack this and go through an example specifically on the uh, next slide uh, from one customer. Hey, Lucas, before we go on to maybe that example, yes, I just wanted, um, someone had a question, Flavio, uh, Flavio they, from, he asked, how would you compare churn probability score to customer to a customer happiness score? Are they simply opposite or not exactly? Is there a sense in using both? Great question. Okay. So there's probably a couple ways to skin this one. Uh, great question. But for me, a customer happiness score, I'd want to understand what you're trying to measure by happiness. What does happiness mean to you, right? So does happiness mean they're going to renew and it's a renewal score? That could be it. Or is happiness an advocacy score? Um, is happiness a growth score? They're going to buy more score. So happiness is a little too soft. It might be fine for a nomenclature of the name. In my opinion, I'd want to know what does happiness actually mean? If happiness means their likelihood to renew, then it's just the inverse of their likelihood to churn. No problem. If happiness means something else like advocacy, or um, their ability, their a desire to buy more, um, then it's not the inverse. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, um, right. I don't see that question in there, but that's okay. So, um, yep. cool, great question, hopefully that helps. All right, so let's go through an example with one customer here. So we'll go back to that variable, and then this model, um, just for example, the success manager comes in and says, hey, this is code one red, which um, you'll need to define what that is pretty specifically. In this, we had very explicit definitions on what code one red or code two was, um, so it wasn't too subjective, but a little bit where code one was like the customer is non-responsive, we can get nothing from them, or they've actually said they intend not to renew, right? or they've had such a severe issue with the product they are unable to use it for their use case. So if those conditions were met and the success manager knew that was the case, right, through their relationship, the customer said that, or they couldn't reach anyone, that's when it would have been a code one red here. So in this case, let's say, great, they're unresponsive. So we don't know what's going on here. And the reason we think they're unresponsive is they've had so many product issues. So we've known about them historically, haven't been able to really figure out what's going on, why they have these issues. There could be many underlying issues there, but the product issue is really the number one thing we think is going on. Relationship health, we have at a yellow here, so maybe it was pretty good before, um, and they did have some usage, but they're flipped in that relationship, but that's coming in as a yellow. The time to renewal, let's say three months away, right? So that automatically pulls in a one on that CPS weight. Growth potential in the account, yes. So we do see some open opportunities, which is interesting. The ARR, let's say it's 750K, so a pretty decent customer there. And they're using us for a really solid use case, which is customer service. So in this case, the CPS is actually a three, uh, which is pretty low. So a 20 to 29% likelihood to churn is what we're showing here. Um, so a lower likelihood, uh, but they have gone dark on us. So um, maybe there's been a change in leadership at the organization. Maybe someone's moved on from the company and they brought someone else in, but they're still really like the solution on customer service, right? This helps you see some of the things that could be going on because there's still growth there. They're pretty high dollar. They use this for a great use case. It's just they've had some issues in the past and now they've gone quiet. Are they evaluating other solutions, but they still need one, so they're using us pretty significantly. You know, those are things you have to unpack, but this data should help bring some insight in there. Let's do another example on the next slide here. For this customer two example, uh, Bert, can I get one slide change for, next slide, there we go, great, thank you. 
In this one, we also are showing a code one red, okay? So something's going on here. Um, you know, maybe they've said in this example, hey, you know, we don't think we're gonna renew this year. And that would make sense looking at the reason type which is we've had a budget change. Maybe budgets have been slashed, this is just doing so well, so I don't think we're gonna be able to renew. Um, and the relationship health is a red as well in this case, which is pretty tough. So it looks like we haven't had a good relationship. Maybe the product's not adopted as much. So in the budget change cycle, they're saying, yeah, we don't really need this. Unfortunately, too, the time to renewal is less than two months away. So we're a month away, let's say, from the renewal date, which doesn't give us much time to get in there and act. Um, we don't have any growth potential on the account either. It doesn't look like there's open opportunities. The ARR, let's say, is at 250K mark. Um, and they're using us for a use case that's okay, but not as strong as some others. So it's a research and development use case. So based on all the CPS added up there, three, three, two, two, one, negative one, and one, you get an 11. So this customer is coming in at an 86 to 95% likely to churn, which is really high. So if this is within the same quarter, now you have some decisions to make. We could lose, you know, around 250K, it looks like, from this customer, or we might be losing around that same 200K from the previous customer who is a 750K customer, um, but was gonna churn a little bit. So um, where do we wanna focus our efforts? We don't have much time here. We have a lot of time on the other one. It's about the same amount of dollars we're gonna save and the likelihood we're gonna save on the other one is much greater um, than on this customer. So if you had to prioritize, you might prioritize saving customer one, which looks like it has a higher probability of being saved and keeping those dollars. Of course. Doesn't mean you just ignore this customer unless you're just severely resource constrained and have no opportunity to pursue this customer. Um, however, if you had to make decisions, you might want to do initiatives that are going to save the dollars that are looking easier to save. Hey, Lucas. Uh, All right. Before you may, um, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Let's, yeah. Good. Before we move on from this slide, there's a few questions people have asked. For example, um, when you measure your churn probability score. What do you feel like the standard practice should be for recognizing that? Should that be monthly, quarterly, last 12 months? I think it depends on how you run your business. I think 12 months is gonna to be too big, personally. Now you might do an annual roll up of previous quarters. Um, and monthly could be fine. Typically what I would say what is, you're gonna do is what are you reporting data on? The quarterly basis for a board is pretty normal. Uh, so that's when I do this. It doesn't mean you aren't looking at monthly data, especially if you're running a monthly recurring revenue business. Um, in an annual recurring revenue business, I'd recommend quarterly. But if you are running a monthly recurring revenue business, then I would look at monthly. You may roll up higher numbers for board meetings, though, as those happen quarterly. Great. Another question on the variables. Um, someone asked, uh, how do you actually, how did you come up with these on the, on the client, under client solution, how did you come up with those, those variable options? Under client solution, those are basically the products or the use cases we have for our product. So if you are, um, your product, you know, think about your product, think about do you sell multiple products, right? So, I don't know, Burke, in your case, you know, you might sell um, additional add-on features, right, to just then the client success-based CRM products, right, and so those could be other solutions. Or if there's different use cases, if you only sell one product, are they using it for different things? Are they leveraging it for different use cases? Um, because some of your use cases may be stronger use cases than others. So that's just your company's solutions, ultimately, is what you're going to put in here. Great answer. Um, there's another person asked. Um, and I probably, as you think about this, to the audience that's in attendance, he, uh, Lucas has came up with a zero to 13 on his CPS, but someone asked the difference between a zero to 13 and a, and a zero to 100% churn probability. What was your, what's your thought on that? So in our model, we used historical data. When we built this process, we had enough quarterly historic data from doing more manual processes in the past to look at. Um, reason codes of churn, we went back in time, put reason codes in place, back in time and put how much churn we actually saw, and we ran a really nerdy regression analysis on that data and uncovered how many tiers of different churn we'd have, and there ended up being 13. So it's a little more like math heavy way where you let the data speak to what we should do in the structure of the template. Um, that's probably not gonna be the most normal way to do this, and I would actually try to, over time, change this to make it a little easier to consume uh, zero to 10 scale, 
you could do zero to 100, but I question what's the difference between a 72 and a 75. Um, you know, it just seems like a pretty big scale to do a zero to 100. Uh, but we let the data speak to what the tiering should be, and it, it presented 13 tiers. Um, but you could easily just say, look, we're going to create 10, and then we're going to fit it into that zero to 10 scale. Great. Good, good, good thought. So you move on to the next part of this. Yeah, I actually see one question in here, too. I might yeah. jump in on, um, yeah. which yeah. is the uh, code one and code two on the red. Yeah. So I could have unpacked that for the slide. I'm sorry I did not. Um, maybe in, uh, the, in the send along after I could do that on another slide. But code one um, was essentially a subjective score that customer success manager could say, hey, either I've seen or heard the customer isn't going to renew or they're non-responsive to me. Um, or they've had, they have a major blockage in terms of being able to use the product for their use case. That was kind of going into code red, and it was data that our systems couldn't necessarily detect. So it was only the success manager's relationship could detect these points. It was a way for some of our quote-unquote offline data points to make it into a formula. Code two was the same type of deal where it was only stuff the success manager had access to through their relationship, but it was frustration with the product. I'm not very happy. It's not really, I don't have like blockers where I'm not able to use it, but I'm not super happy with some of the features and how things are working. And so it was more of a like a way for the success manager to provide input into a data driven model that said this is severe code one red, or this is like, look, they're not super happy, but they haven't you know gone to that severe level yet. So that's the difference between uh, that one and that one and two. Great. We've had a few people ask, you know, how do you get started? You've done regression analysis to get these variables. What if someone doesn't have a lot of data? Do they Great question. Let's they, hold that because yeah. I'm going to go through a few yeah. more slides. If I don't answer okay. that, remind me in the next okay. couple slides. Great question. Perfect. Great. All right. So let's jump on here and just talk a little bit about some of the outcomes you get out of this. And then we're going to move into how you get started, which is where we can talk about that question. So I'll try to address it there. So we talked about some of the benefits and outcomes to me is a little bit different def definition. Um, but the outcomes that we were able to see through this was, you know, A, we were able to start having accurate forecasting of the ARR turn that we were going to see by quarter, which is huge. Uh, right. So everyone is aligned on the business. Um, everyone had a good understanding, helped avoid surprise churn, uh, which is very important. Um, the second piece is we were able to understand what levers we needed to pull in order to retain these customers by different verticals, by different regions. And so getting some of the why data behind the reason for um, seeing this churn end up um, being predicted uh, was very, very helpful in order to then modify the business in a way that helped the business be more successful. We were also then able to see systemic retention trends. So it was great to see for the quarter and understand what action do we need to put in place straight away to save dollars within the quarter. Um, but it was also helpful to see systemically what's happening over time and especially to look at the forecast versus what actually happened and be able to compare those and tweak the model as we go. And then the fourth one here, of course, is be able to prioritize save efforts. So just like in the example, right, we had those two customers, one was a higher dollar value, um, you know, lower churn probability. The other one, though, had a really high churn probability, but lower dollar. You might see that, oh, high churn probability. I need to go fix that issue. But if you step back and look at the data and look at the dollars being about the same amount, one looks a little easier to save, actually, even though it's lower likelihood it's going to churn. That's actually where I would focus my efforts. So it really helped prioritize uh, what we're going to do from a save perspective. And the next slide here, I mean, the biggest outcome kind of speaks for itself in terms of results. We were able to see a 95% customer retention rate um, through this program. And, you know, there's, of course, lots of stuff going on in the business. It also takes a great team and hiring the right people and having the right processes in place to uh, manage relationships. It takes having a great product. It takes selling a great product, of course. There's a lot that goes into um, retaining customers. Um, at a great rate, but in any case, this definitely helped us improve and get visibility there to our customer retention data. A couple added benefits that I don't know if we've talked about. So if you're not necessarily in a success management or a post-sales role, um, but you're in a selling capacity, 
Um, the data that this revealed was actually really helpful to know which customers to target and how to sell to them, and also maybe how and when not to sell to them. So giving this data to our sales team uh, was really beneficial to help them prioritize and see, oh, wow, this customer is really healthy and they don't use this for XYZ. Maybe they should use this for XYZ. Or, well, they're in pain and they're not happy, but it's because they're not using the right product mix. Let's get in there and make sure they have the right products to achieve their outcomes, right? So it helps the sales organization. Also helps product marketing in order to be able to produce all the collateral required to address needs. If we're seeing systemic comprehension issues or adoption issues, then we can focus our efforts and say, look, let's prioritize helping customers understand how to adopt and use this part of our product because we're seeing these trends. Anytime I ever saw multiple success managers saying the same thing, I knew it was time to centralize that message. Same thing in terms of doing the same task. It was time to centralize those tasks. That's a topic for another day, maybe. Um, marketing, being able to leverage this for customer profiling and what we call the next logical solution marketing. So on the, on the heels of kind of that sales uh, benefit is in mass being able to understand, hey, Customers who typically use us for X need us for Y. So let's start marketing that next, next logical solution for this customer. And then for the success organization, um, also tied to sales there, but where they have gaps in terms of not being able to meet their goals, being able to help upsell those customers into products that would help them or cross sell into products that would actually help them if their business goals have changed over time. There's many other added benefits I'm sure you could see from this. Um, there's a lot of time savings that goes involved. There's a lot of confidence, a lot of ease of reporting, too. Um, but those were some of the ones that I thought were pretty interesting for other organizations, too. All right, so let's get after that question and talk about how to get started. So the first place to start is to get an understanding of the data you currently possess. So, you know, in that previous um, example, we had, okay, what's the customer ARR? I would hope you have that, right? You got to know that. When are they, re what's the renewal date? That's like table stakes, right? We need to know that. What they purchase us for? What products do they have? What solutions do they have? Um, so getting an understanding of the data you have access to is great, right? You need to know that. Then if you have access to understanding historical churn information, even if it's just a quarter or two quarters, if it's a year, even better. But if you have access to that, maybe you weren't classifying it. So then we need to go into that historical churn data and understand what churned and why. Try to get into some reason codes for that churn. Oh, it's a product issue, oh, it's a relationship issue, and create those reason codes. And look at what does the data say as to why customers churned. Um, and create those reason codes for that churn. And understand, okay, this is why customers typically churn. If you have no historic data, it's okay. You can anticipate why customers are going to churn. A lot of these are not specific to any one business, right? If you're a SaaS business, product adoption is going to be on there. Are they not using your product? If they don't use the product, that's a risk event. They definitely should be using the product. Now, you might need to understand more the frequency of use, how much consumption is good of your product, right? If they bought 10 licenses and they only use five half the time, is that a good benchmark or is that underperformance on adoption? So you need to dive in there. A lot of the other metrics around those reason, score, reason codes are going to be somewhat standard with a little bit of nuance to your business. So gather the data, create the historic or create the, pardon me, the reason codes for churn, whether you have historic data or not, and then you can at least begin to create the variables that you're going to score customers against. And you can just use the ones I've had in here. You'll get this deck um, as a start. The next part in terms of walk is, if you can do this, now I might need someone to help you do this, um, but run a regression analysis on the past data to understand the ranges and the variables of churn that existed historically. So, yeah, what? I don't get all this. Don't worry. Ask client success to help. They can help you do this. Uh, I could help you do this. There are many people who could actually help in terms of understanding what should happen within your framework here. But it's okay if you don't have historical data. You will have historical data. In a little bit so just put the plans in place start the framework and then use the, your best judgment and then just modify it as you go this framework should not be something that you just set and forget it should be something that's modified that changes your forecast will not be 100 percent accurate every quarter it should be pretty close and it should get closer but when we started i think we were in like the 70 percent accuracy and grew it to 80 and then to 90 and i bet it stayed in the low 90s at that point forever so 
um, it's not ever going to be 100% accurate. You're always going to want to modify and change. So if you don't have historical data, just put the best plans in place as you can, measure for the month or for the quarter, and run it again, and then modify as you go. That might get a little bit into that run phase here in the next slide, um, which is you know, to score all of your renewing customers then. So you have customers that are coming up for renewal. We always did this a quarter ahead, by the way. So if you're on calendar year, you've just started your Q3 um, fiscal. And so it's not too late to run Q3. You probably still have customers renewing, probably a lot of them towards the um, tail end of Q3. But I would also be running Q4 right now to look ahead. Um, so we would actually run six months ahead. Um, so like I would want to run at the start of Q3, I'd be running Q4s. Um, and so I would have visibility to everything happening for the next six months. Um, so score all those customers. Go in and actually see what it says. Okay, maybe you do the subjective red, you know, code on them. Cool. You do the reason for churn. Great. You do if they're um, healthy um, in terms of the relationship. You do the product scoring on them. And go ahead and score those customers and, and take a look at, does this map to what my success manager is saying is the risk we could see in that account? And then modify the weight of your reason codes. So if you see, oh, wow, if you put a, you know, a three on budget, it really over indexes a lot. And that's not actually what we're seeing as reality. When budgets change in our business, we're able to work through those. So let's lower that down to a one weighting instead of a three, because three is pretty high. And then at a minimum, renew this uh, review, the work that you're doing annually, um, at a minimum. But I would be doing it quarterly and always kind of tweaking the model if you have the luxury to do that. All right, so uh, with that, you win. There you go. You get a gold trophy or a nice like uh, glass one, like the the uh, what was that Innovator of the Year um, award, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, I appreciate you talking about this for a little bit. We've had a lot of people ask a few questions. We have actually probably 20 open questions. But one thing I wanted to talk about: a lot of people have asked how you collect this, how you get started, and this is overwhelming. How do I not get analysis paralysis? How do I do some regression analysis? We remember sitting in the back of your presentation, it was a fall last year, and, and seeing you present that, hey, everyone's going to be different. There's going to be people might want to have their score to 100. Someone might want their score to be 13. Someone might want their score to be X and, and these ways to make this very configurable and easy to get started. So we sat in the back. We said, you know what? And listening to Lucas, I think there's, there's a big need or ability for people to create a, a profile. It could be a term probability score. And we noodled on this, and I'm excited to kind of show this live to people, which is we've called this the success score. And this is the ability, as you can see here on the bottom part of this slide, things like product usage, sentiment, scorecard, advocacy, engagement, anything that you want to develop and you have access to with your data. So if you're figuring out how you can get started with this, just really, we, we love to you know help you with this at Client Success. We've built software that allows you to show trends on how the score is going. It allows you to configure specific profiles. Like right now, this is a churn probability score. Um, the lower the score in this case, the more likelihood that they're going to score. We want them to be 100. That means they're more satisfied with what they're using. But I wanted to give you props. I know the customer success community and, and around the world is trying to figure out how do we do things better? How do we use technology, people, and process to make it better? So this was just kind of something that inspired our thoughts in technology. So if you're out there wondering where do you get started, um, how do you get started to do this, um, come over to clientsuccess.com and request a demo, and, and we'd love to help you with that. But shout out to Lucas for, for really inspiring this innovation and then helping us put it to technology. So I'll go back to winning. Nice yeah, job. <laughs> super, Burke. I love that. Oh, man, that's so so helpful. Yeah, I definitely recommend taking advantage um, because it can help in terms of dealing with, you know, this. Luckily, I had the fortunate um, ability to have a great success operations team um, to help me do this and manage through this. But you get such a head start by having a framework like this already in place. So super cool. All right. So what questions yeah. can I uh, – can we um, let me dive into, here. Burke? Yeah, if you this is from Bill. He says if you have a client that has a CPS that had a CPS, you typically take them off at risk status right away 
or wait until you were able to leverage your customer success manager processes to get them to a point where they reach success milestones and adopt the product. Okay, if they had a CPS. Okay, I think I understand this. Um, so we would look at relationship health separately, and that would be an indicator in this. This was primarily a renewal-based metric for us to understand actual dollars renewal. It wasn't, we didn't use this to look at adoption or look at relationship health. Those were other things we did throughout managing the life cycle of a customer. So for us, this is done once the customer renewed, and then it would come up again to help us forecast renewals and the likelihood for churn at renewals. But there were other scores we would use in other processes throughout the life cycle of the customer if they were unhealthy or unhappy in some way from a relationship standpoint. This is specific towards the renewal event for us with the customer, if that helps. So once they renewed, they were done with it for now. Doesn't mean all everything was done. We stopped talking to them. We didn't try to fix anything. It was over. It just meant, well, we're trying to forecast dollars that we're renewing. And so that, that time period has come and gone. So now they drop out of this until the next cycle when you run a run it and forecast the renewal likelihood again. Awesome. Um, let me look through a few of these other ones. Uh, see if we, someone asked, uh, Debbie asked, can you repeat how, how you measure relationship health score? Yeah, so relationship health score uh, was actually a whole separate, it almost looks like GPS, to be honest, so that'd be a separate topic, but relationship health was comprised of um, a few different variables. Um, one would be the product adoption um, of the uh, customer. Um, it would be the actual like number of contacts and the type of contact or the quality of contact we have, as well as the frequency of contact that we've had with the customer. Um, and then a few other key like product usage things around, are they using some key sticky features um, to get after like an all up health score? The relationship part was just, if I were to break down relationship, I would just focus on um, number of known relationships, the type of relationship, right? From influencer, economic buyer, and then the frequency of, relation, of contact that we have with those relationships. So those three things that I'd focus on, we lumped it into a few other things to get an all up health score. So I'll say it again. It's number of contacts, the type of those contacts, right? Because some of them are more important than others, and then the frequency of contact with those contacts. Great thought. Um, what are your thoughts on, we talked about this approach from maybe a high touch. Um, how would someone roll this out to maybe a lower touch or they have a mix of both high touch, low touch customers? So I still think the framework applies. It especially applies for low touch customers where you probably don't have as much insight into what's actually happening because you don't have eyes, you know, into everything that's going on in the customer. You're not visiting them as much. So this is where having the data speak to what's happening in the account for low touch is going to be especially important. Um, however, it's not that it's not applicable to high touch customers because just because your CSM has a great relationship with a few people in the account doesn't mean that customer is going to renew, right? That customer could have product issues that we don't see. There could be other business lines globally that are under adopting, but also are a big part of the license. So it's still applicable for a high touch model. Um, but in a low touch, it should especially help you scale your knowledge of what's happening in your accounts there. Awesome. Now, another question came, says, do you do these assessments? when one of your CSM identifies a potential return risk, or you do them for all clients so you can better all clients. You know, understand risk? Every, so, yeah, so if it's July, you know, July 1, I'm going to run all of my Q3, Q4. I've already run Q3, by the way, at the end of Q1, so I'm going to run the upcoming two quarters, every renewal, and I'm going to be, it's going to be an update to what was run on the, like, quarter we're in, so it'll be an update to Q3, but then I did my first look at Q4, just to make sure that we understand what's happening is we're gonna have to forecast the upcoming quarter at the beginning of that quarter. So that's what I'm doing, I'm running every renewal that's coming in for the next six months, always in this. Yeah, I think that's a great approach and it helps you be that, take that more proactive side to managing customer health and, and customer risk and, and success of our customers. 
Well, um, I think very appreciative of your time, Lucas. I went a year ago or a couple months ago when we, we saw this on the stage, it was inspiring. Uh, all the effort you went into, you know, really providing this great framework for people to build both risks or even success of customers to be more really proactive. A lot of times we get out there and we, we become a real reactive organization as we approach our customer success strategy. So thanks for coming on to the webinar series that we hold monthly and, and you're taking your time to explain this. I think this is very valuable. Um, if you want to hit up uh, Lucas with some questions, Lucas is on LinkedIn. He's a very passionate entrepreneur, very successful customer success professional, um, very smart. So if you guys need any things there, you can start networking with them, with with him on, on LinkedIn and, o and other ways. Um, but I wanted to thank you, Lucas, for coming, stopping by the Client Success, Customer Success Webinar Series.